All right, perfect. So let's uh, let's start. Thank you very much for joining another um, into the blog webinar. Every three weeks, we try to discuss some of the hottest topics in the uh, in the industry. And today, we're gonna do a little bit of a second version of one of our most popular webinars that happened a couple of months ago. That it, it was related to the intersection of generative AI and Web3. This was one of our popular, the most popular webinars ever run. Um, this was a subject of my session on consensus and, and a few articles at CoinDesk. And, and so we have been developing quite a bit of a thesis uh, in, in the intersection of these two areas. And what we wanted to do today is just bring a refreshed version of, uh, of new ideas in the space differently from the no, new, uh, previous webinar, we're really going to focus on some ambitious ideas that are possible with um, uh, with today's uh, technology. So the agenda is super simple. So we're going to talk about a brief history of foundation models just to set, um, set the context. And then we're going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about some very ambitious ideas about at the intersection of, of uh, Web3 and generative AI. So you're not going to hear the sort of the obvious, um, we should have a search engine based on generative AI and, and things like that. Like none of the basic stuff, like we're going to go deeper into some fundamental technological building blocks that could be enabled with this technology as well as uh, some key challenges. So an update, uh, as, as always, I'd like to start with an, a quick update about, uh, about ITV, uh, where we recap some of the developments of the last few weeks. Uh, a very interesting one is that in our analytics product, we launched analytics for optimism. And the response from the community has been very good. And uh, so you can just check it out, go to appintotheblog.com and look for optimism and you're gonna see uh, a lot of uh, analytics for the optimism blockchain. As many of you will know, we have been incubating um, a project for monitoring risk in DeFi based on a lot of the work that we do in quantitative strategies in DeFi. Uh, we have partnered with a lot of the top protocols in the space to, to go to market. This is still in alpha, but we have been launching different protocols just to test uh, the concept. And recently we unveiled analytics for Moonwell. Uh, then you can go to D5 Risk Radar, um, uh, that into the blog.com and, and check um, uh, and check the analytics for Moonwell and other protocols. And we're going to be adding uh, quite a few uh, protocols before uh, the launch, including all the major D5 protocols that, that we have partner, uh, partnered up with for this uh, endeavor. Then, in addition to that, very soon, you're going to see analytics for Arbitrum in the in the ITV analytics platform. We're also going to, we're doing a release focus on um, uh, a, a new batch of high quality uh, indicators with uh, fairly decent statistical profile, uh, some new ideas, and then uh, you're going to see a lot of new protocols on the, on the D5 risk rate. So that's as much as we have as um, uh, for an update uh, uh, from the last three weeks. And then we're gonna start with the topic today. So um, before we start getting into a lot of the uh, ideas at the intersection of generative AI and, uh, and Web3, I think it is probably good to uh, give some context about where this revolution of generative AI is coming from. Because of, in, in the Web3 space, there is still not a very strong culture in terms of um, machine learning and, and AI knowledge. So a lot of the, the fruits of this uh, research and where it's coming from and a lot of the underpinning might, might, might surprise you. Um, so in the, in the machine learning world, this idea, this type of models like uh, GPT-4 or ChatGPT, they're known as foundation models. So, so this, is, uh, this is the term that is actively used in the, in the machine learning uh, space instead of, uh, instead of generative uh, AI. By foundation models, we're talking about this paradigm in which we go from the traditional supervised learning um, approach in which you would train a model in a lot of label data and tested with a subset of that data, we go into a paradigm in which you train a model with a massive amount of unlabeled data 
and then fine tune it for very specific scenarios we label data. So what happened is that at certain scale, this type of models uh, above certain number of parameters, that is how, how it's called the, the weights of the models, this, this, type of, uh, this type of architectures that were training massive amounts of unlabeled data, think about Wikipedia or things like that, start exhibiting properties that you would not see in the traditional supervised learning um, uh, scenarios. So for instance, models that were trained for question answering turn out to be good at completing sentences, turn out to be good on sentiment analysis and, and things like that. This all originated in 2016 with a paper called Attention is All You Need that came from Google, the Google Brain uh, uh, team. Uh, and um, essentially, it proposed a new architecture known as the transformer architecture that sort of addressed some of the limitations of um, of traditional um, sequential models, fundamentally architectures like convolutional neural networks or long-term memory networks, that they were very effective. But after certain amount of uh, 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 tokens or, or certain amount of the, the length of a sequence, think about processing a, a large document, had trouble remembering things and could only go back certain amount of, of Token. So the, this new transformer architecture is fundamentally simple. It's very elegant, but uh, essentially it, it focuses attention on different parts of the sequence. And they prove that by determining which of those parts you should pay attention to, this could scale um, quite a bit. And what happened, the reason you, you listen to this, you, you hear this term all the time, large language models, is because the transformer architecture unlocked this paradigm that sort of bigger is better. Uh, and that lasted until, let's say, this year. And you could see it, it unlocked a race to build the largest models. And for a while, there was a race that was very even between OpenAI, DeepMind, Google Brain, Microsoft Research, and, uh, and, and, and a few other labs. To some extent, you could say that GPT-3 was becoming the dominant um, model in the space, but it was not particularly impressive. It was not mainstream. Uh, you could do a, lot, a number of things, but there were plenty of use cases that it, that it couldn't address. So the question that I get asked all the time is what changed between GPT-3 and ChatGPT or the model underneath ChatGPT that is known as GPT-3.5? So the answer to this might surprise you because it's a research that dates back to 2017. And it was a research created by OpenAI with a, um, a very uh, cryptic title called Deep Reinforcement Learning for Human Preferences. So essentially reinforcement learning is this deep learning technique in which you train a model by trial and effort. Uh, you do something, it tells you it's good or not, you get some feedback and you optimize. It became um, sort of popular because it was a model used by DeepMind to train AlphaGo. That was a, the deep learning model that beat Lisi Go, the six time Go um, world champion. And Go was one of those uh, problems that were considered unsolvable uh, for the entire history of artificial intelligence. And this was the technique that cracked uh, that problem. The thing with reinforcement learning is that other than in gaming scenarios, it, it didn't quite found a ton of success. I mean, there were things in, in biopharmacy and, and, and some microbiology, so, some scenarios like that, but it's very data intensive. So the example that I like to use is that AlphaGo had to play the equivalent of a hundred years of a human Go player nonstop to get that level of knowledge. So at some point, so in that sense, reinforcement learning was quite constrained. But, um, and then on the other side, you have models like GPT-3 that will give you a lot of answers to human prompts, but many times those answers didn't align with the intentions of the human. And then OpenAI had this idea, so well, what if we can have creative reinforcement learning model that learns a human preference? You can give it feedback about whether an answer was correct or not, and fine tune the model on that. And the combination of GPT-3 plus RLHF, like reinforcement learning with human feedback, created this model in 2022 called InstructGPT. So this thing went completely under the radar. 
And this is a model that proven to be very good to follow instructions. So if you will tell GPT-3 parse a, a JSON data set or things like that, it wouldn't know how to do it. It didn't know how to follow instructions that reflect the human preference. So instruct GPT was a model that unlocked that, that it was not only good at processing language, right? But it was good at following instructions, understanding what the intention was before between a specific set of uh, utterances. And then instruct GPT plus GPT-3, that's what we know as chat GPT or GPT-3.5. So the whole frenzy with chat GPT was, it was created as a demo for the uh, for the GPT-3.5 capabilities to highlight many of the things that were gonna be launched in GPT-4. And it just became this massive uh, success as a standalone uh, product. Now, this is all language. While this was happening in language, uh, there was another part of uh, revolution that was happening in the image, uh, the computer vision, uh, a space with a very similar architecture to the transformer architecture that we used to, that is called diffusion. So the dominant architecture and computer visions are things like conv convolutional neural networks and focus on doing very complex operations in, in matrices. Uh, diffusion was is a transformer model in which one side essentially decomposes the image, takes an image and decomposes it onto something that is basically noise. And the other side knows how to recon reconstruct that image to its original form. So by deconstructing the image, essentially what that means mathematically is that you represent that image in like a 10,000 dimensional space. And an interesting thing happened. So it turns out that the concepts when you have a concept, let's say a cat in language and a cat in an image in a multi, in a high, sufficiently high dimensional space, there is close proximity. So that caused a, an entire explosion in text to image models because we figure out like, okay, so if there is proximity between these two, that means that I can interpret language to generate image. And that's where you see all these models that are generating photorealistic artistic images based on natural language input like mid-journey, stable diffusion, DALI2, and things like that. From that group, stable diffusion deserved uh, a very uh, uh, unique mention because it was the first model that crossed into the open source uh, space, the first large-scale model. So until stable diffusion, there was a massive debate that is still ongoing whether there was a, 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 this model should be open source because it could be easily weaponized for pornography or for fake news and, and things like that, and or, or worse uh, scenarios. And this company, Stability AI, came out of the blue. The research for stable diffusion was not even there. So it was a, a lab in the University of Munich. And they said, let's open source this and see what the community have to say. And that showed that, that it was possible to, to open source um, this type of models. Now, the interesting thing is at certain scale, these foundation models start exhibiting capabilities that were not pre-trained for, like coding, right? OpenAI created this thing called Codex. I was trained in Python and long to behold, it mastered a lot of different programming languages to, to generate soft, um, generate code based on natural language uh, input, uh, mathematical reasoning, right? That these models have been getting good enough to solve problems at the math Olympiad type of level and also assisting with mathematical research. There is a famous paper from DeepMind that one of these models helped uh, create a new, discover a new method for matrix multiplication that was uh, way faster than the traditional methods that we learn in algebra uh, classes. And that, that was something that hasn't been done in 60 years. And it was all with the help of, uh, of one of these models. So all these properties started emerging. And then that took us to a transition of, instead of models that do language or computer vision or audio, models that do, can do a, a lot of things at the same time, and that's GPT-4. So GPT-4 combines language, image, code, coding, and many other things in a, in a single language. Now, this was, um, if when I did this presentation a, a few weeks ago, uh, this was sort of the, these slides were there, but then something has changed in the last in the last two months, and uh, in this space. So it, this uh, foundation model space is moving at a frantic pace. The biggest change 
uh, in the last two months is the emergence of open source models. So we, and we mentioned stable diffusion, but it was mostly an isolated case. For a while, there was a massive gap between commercial models like Anthropic, Cohere, OpenAI, behind APIs and open source models. And then something happened. So Meta, the Meta AI Research uh, Lab published a paper for a model called Lama uh, here that was essentially a language model relatively smaller to, to the GPTs, but to match the performance of GPT-3. Um, and then the model was not intended to be open source or so they claim uh, day one. They were gonna release some level of access. And then a couple of weeks after, accidentally, the weights of the model got leaked in Fort Chain. And then what that happened, what happened is that a lot of university labs pick up the model and start building on top. And it has created an entire explosion on open source innovation. You have funny, they all um, they all use uh, animal names, but you have things like but um by Kiona, uh, UC Berkeley created this thing called Koala. Uh, Stanford University created a thing called Alpaca. Uh, you have um, uh, different initiatives like ServiceNow, Hugging Face, uh, um, partnering for a thing called Start Coder for code uh, uh, generation. Uh, there is a thing called Gorilla also out of UC Berkeley. There is a new one that just came out two weeks ago called Falcon LLM that is matching GPT-4 type of performance. And you're seeing this level of innovation in open source. And famously, a few weeks ago, there was a, a memo, leak in, an internal memo at Google, in which one of the engineers said essentially that Google it has no moat for in, in this foundation model space because the like, Google modes were always uh, size and speed and said that we're not gonna be faster than anybody else. We're not gonna be bigger than anybody else in this space. That's probably my interpretation of it. They're, we're trying to compete with open AI and said like the biggest innovation here is on the open source side. This is what's gonna disrupt us. And we can see the quality between the open source and the API base shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And more and more models are going on the open source. Right, so this is something new, seven, eight weeks uh, of, uh, of, uh, of time frame is what we're talking about. So from a conceptual standpoint, you should think about generative AI and foundation models as a most transformational technology movement of several generations. Certainly that includes uh, crypto generative AI's orders of magnitude, more transformational than crypto. This is gonna change literally everything. Um, and the open source momentum has created all sorts of opportunities for Web3 that were not there before. So this is what I wanna do now in the next few minutes is explore some of those more moonshot ideas and how to think about it. You're gonna get plenty of obvious ideas. So you, we're seeing this, so you're gonna get, th this has to be done, right? But, but ideas like, you know, incorporating chatbots in exchange of wallets or in explorers or analyzing social media, threats with this type of thing or generative art in NFTs, all those are valid, but they're not gonna incre increase, they're not gonna unlock massive value for Web3. They're incremental uh, improvements. When the a way to think about value here is the lower you go on the stack, we need to bring the bigger value of logs is bringing generative AI to Web3 as a foundational component of Web3. I'm like 100% convinced of this. So uh, a way to think about this is as you go up the stack, it's easier to build, but less value. So in, you start with that. And if you bring generative AI to smart contracts, that's bigger value to nodes, that's bigger value to uh, protocols that are specific, that's bigger, eventually blockchain runtimes. But the minute we get to embed generative AI as a core class component of Web3 platforms is where the bigger value, because that essentially allows to build up the stack anything from infrastructure to that. And it, uh, when you put that on the hands of developers, magic, uh, magical things uh, happen. So I want to show a few, discuss a few of those non-trivial ideas that I think are very, very interesting and very powerful at the intersection of generative AI and Web3 and, and go a little bit technical and explore how that could get done. 
So one idea, it's, it's only six, so it's, it's not gonna take a ton of time. So one interesting idea is this thing that we call proof of knowledge protocol. So there is a real issue in generative AI and foundation models with the lack of transparency of a lot of those models. Nobody really knows how GPT-4 works, what's behind it. And many companies have issues with, you know, passing data via those APIs. Even if the license agreements are clear that they're not going to be used for fine tuning, it's very concerning. So going, um, having models that protocols are proof on chain, like this is how this model was trained, this is how it was validated, it doesn't contain this type of content, this type of content. This, so those things are, are quite interesting. So there are different capabilities that could be uh, interesting here. Like I mentioned, for instance, that Llama, the leaks of the weights of the model got leaked. Well, what if I could have proof of weights? Like I could say, these are the weights of this model, but I could have a zero knowledge proof of that. I don't need to tell you exactly how it was also validating for bias or toxic thing, or the fact that this model was fine tuned in this specific data set. So it knows how to, it understands solidity pretty well because it was fine tuning this data set of a smart contract uh, and things like that. Then I mentioned the RLA shift, the reinforcement learning with uh, with human feedback. So there is three main workflows that happen in generative AI and foundation models. One is pre-training that you start from scratch and pre-training model in, in a lot of large data sets. Another is fine tuning that you take that model and fine tune it for a specific use case. And the third one is inference. That is essentially predictions. So I give you a prompt, you give me an answer. I give you a prompt, you give me an image and things like that. What if you could have economic models for that. Imagine a network in which you have these models and you could have, I, I want to fine tune a model and the nodes could actually fine tune it and they can get compensated for that. And, and there are plenty of uh, scenarios for that, like fine tuning models on RLA chef, fine tuning models to follow instructions, fine tuning, um, uh, uh, executing models and being compensated for that. Then uh, there is obviously, there is a ton of momentum in Web3 in terms of zero knowledge. And I think this intersection probably Web3 is the one area in which zero knowledge uh, algorithms are being applied at a decent scale. So there is a, a lot of interesting ideas. At, at, at the intersection of the life cycle of foundation models and zero knowledge, um, Algorithms, so I could issue zero knowledge proof that this model produced this output without revealing the output or that this model was pre-trained this way without revealing the uh, the data set or that it was fine-tuned this way without revealing uh, the process. I think this is valid particularly in, in many uh, mission um, self-regulated uh, mission critical industries. Then moving up the stack, uh, there is a lot of value on uh, bringing LLMs to smart contracts. In the generative AI world, we have frameworks that, have called, uh, that, that are capturing a lot of momentum like LangChain, like Lama Index, and Microsoft has this thing called Semantic Kernel. That is essentially, as a programmer, if I wanna use LLMs, uh, large language models, is more than just sending a prompt and getting an answer. Typically, you combine different models or different iterations to achieve a result. You need to persist concepts, what is called memory structures uh, to, to actually reuse. Uh, later, you need to test uh, those models for certain things. Uh, there is, you know, the saving the prompts. There is an entire infrastructure that goes into that. And these frameworks have made the experience for Python developers very seamless. Like you could be writing a Python app that, it, that it, it combines traditional Python with LLMs and it feels natural. I think this idea for solidity and for Rust is very powerful. So bringing tra tra uh, uh, traditional LLMs, traditional is, uh, is a bit of a, an overloaded term uh, here, but uh, bringing LLMs uh, and that a natural experience in a framework that makes solidity developers use, but not, not anybody can call an API, but just having that experience of combining different models, having memory structures and, uh, uh, and things like that, those are some of the capabilities. So I think a land chain for smart contracts, I think it's a very powerful ideas. And then continue moving down the stack, obviously a layer two for generative AI. And I think this, um, uh, at the Alan Summit recently, the CEO of Alan has mentioned a similar idea to this, 
but essentially think of a layer two that the interaction between the nodes is language. So imagine that we could have validators that uh, essentially could communicate with transactions just based on language. They could understand language. You don't have to have, obviously it will be uh, somewhat limited in terms of the, the things that it can do today, but it could, uh, it could grow into all sorts of scenarios of, that we're not thinking, but instead of uh, interacting via uh, a smart contracts, in the sense of solidity code, you can interact via language and the validators will understand language and that will be sort of the, uh, the core protocol uh, of the chain. So this is a, this is a blockchain with genera built with generative AI at, at, at the core, right? Building from the ground up. And obviously the explosion of layer twos with zero knowledge proof, the Cosmos ecosystem is also very, very well suited uh, for uh, some of these ideas. Now, the complement to that idea is a blockchain or a decentralized network to run to execute generative AI. So generative AI infra, infrastructure today is fundamentally centralized, is controlled. Even the platforms that host a lot of models, they're, they're, you're dealing with their infrastructure. So we think there is a, there is, there is a need on the market. Like, like I, I see this from uh, uh, parties that I interact with in the generative AI for a more decentralized and open alternative. So a network that is able to run nodes for hosting public data sets, executing models, executing fine tuning workloads, having all these protocols for validating the weights of the models and things like that is, um, uh, is quite interesting. So these are six, I'll say non-trivial, uh, ambitious ideas that I think each one of them could unlock new waves of value for the Web3 space. So uh, one thing that I that I uh, been very vocal about, and even brought an article in CoinDesk about this, this is a major issue for the Web3 ecosystem. So at a personal level, uh, this is not an into the block position or anything. It bothers me quite a bit that the industry is not talking about this in a more vocal fashion. So generative AI is creating a massive gap between technological gap between the web two and web three ecosystem. If that continues, what the web three is basically gonna be in the stone age. It's just hard to convince developers to come write a smart contract so you could be writing really futuristic stuff in the web two space with, uh, with all these models because all development stacks in the web two, uh, in the web two space are being reimagined with these capabilities as a core, uh, as a core building block. So this is something that needs to be addressed. The problem goes very deep because for 10, 12 years, we never bothered to build a foundation for machine learning in Web3. It does not exist. You cannot run models. There is no the machine learning stacks in Solidity. The blockchain infrastructures are not well suited to execute any form of high computation environment. So it's really costly. And then because this movement is happening elsewhere, development talent, VC investments is gravitating towards data space and is taking value from Web3, even if, uh, if we don't see it um, directly. So I think this idea, some of the ideas that, that we mentioned, like fundamentally decentralizing generative AI, proof of knowledge protocols could contribute natively to bring a lot of these capabilities uh, to Web3. And we think that a new generation of Web3 platforms need to emerge with generative AI as a core component. If not, I think the space could have very system, uh, systemic issues uh, in terms of the technological future. I think if, if we all agree, that generative AI is changing the entire development landscape and applications are going to be built with these models as a core component that has to happen in Web3 uh, as well. So to summarize what we discussed, generative AI is by far the most transformational movement of several generations. I think there is a, a lot of value in use cases um, like bringing conversational experience and things like that to well, it's but working on the more 
uh, ambitious use cases such as uh, embedding generative AI as a core component of Web3 infrastructure is probably way more, more interesting. That's all I have. I want to take questions now. I think there are a few, but before that, in three weeks, our head of research, Lucas of Tomorrow, is going to be doing uh, a webinar about uh, uh, key trends that we're seeing uh, in crypto, particularly triggered by the regulatory uh, crackdown. So some of the new opportunities and trends that we're seeing in the space. I think the link is being shared in the chat, so please go uh, please go register. Um, with that, I'm going to go to questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A or, uh, or the chat. So um, Luya Osan is asking that LLMs consume a lot of computing power. Consider the scalability issues as a blockchain. Could a smart, uh, how smart contracts can better support the training of LLM? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, no blockchain in the current market is well equipped to handle the compute cost of some things. It, it's getting better though. Like some of these models, particularly the new open source generation, is not as crazy as training GPT-4. Like they could run in four TPUs or GPUs or things like that, but it still is uh, is quite costly compared to what it takes to run a node in a vanilla blockchain. So I sort of, this, the, I think this sort of requires a new network or a version of an existing chain with, um, uh, if you're, if we're talking about building a layer two or something with a uh, different computing requirements, a la Solana uh, or, uh, or something, uh, or something like that. Uh, there are a couple of thank you uh, notes. Uh, um, and then there is some questions about um, uh, models and some questions about ITV analytics. I think we can answer that uh, via, uh, via email. Jesse uh, is asking, do you think generative AI's ability to create deep fakes will ultimately link to the mainstream NFTs in order to validate the veracity of the content? I, I'm not sure. Like, I think there is certainly uh, enough need to come up with ideas to validate content uh, fact checking. Uh, this models, I'm not sure if NFTs is the way, right? But but essentially, fact that there is an entire um, trend called knowledge augmented foundation models that is about that. That is okay. This thing gave me an answer. Can we fact check it and reprint it uh, with different things? And and I think it's bigger than NFTs. Is is uh, it's a lot of uh, augmenting the model with real-time knowledge and out, authority sources. I'm sure. I mean, some ownership mechanisms could be could be enough, but it could be interesting. But I'm not sure it's going to be enough to um, to solve the uh, to solve the problem. Um, any oh, okay? Solana is the first chat GPT AI focused blockchain with potential one million to, uh, one million transaction per second. Do you feel this chain has the potential to become the leading AI consumer app chain? Uh, look, I don't know. Like what Solana did is they built a chat GPT plugin, so that's very different. So you can query the Solana chain using chat GPT. That that's a very Yes, the Solana nodes since the beginning have a very uh, high uh, compute requirement that's based on the design. And from that point of view, some of those, the hardware could be used to host a lot of these models. Now, what Solana doesn't have is that if you think about the architecture that is needed, this goes into the weeds now, into the technical weeds, but the architecture needed to run these models is more than just having uh, GPU power in the topologies of those GPUs have to be architected in in, uh, in certain ways. Some of these models are fine tuning is parallelizable, so you have to have nodes that can take sections of the data set and can reconcile it. So it's a new network architecture. So I don't think that you can just take a bunch of Solana nodes. Can you host one model or two? Yes, but to make it general purpose, I don't know, but intuitively, I don't think it's that. Um, I don't think it's that simple. And then you have to. There is a there is a second part that is a more functional question. Is that Solana nodes are designed to validate transactions. So what are you doing? What are we doing? Putting models in in those nodes, right? Like it's just going to take away 
and the validation power of it. Any, uh, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for joining. I really enjoyed this and I hope to see you in three weeks. Thank you very much.